All right, I'll open us in prayer and we'll start this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sunday, an opportunity to gather with your people, an opportunity to proclaim your worth, to worship you in singing songs to one another and to you, to sit under your word, to be equipped for ministry. God, we pray this morning as we look again at evangelism that you would be honored in our feeble attempts to convey the greatness of your glory, uh, the, the awful reality of your justice, uh, the beauty of your holiness, and the amazing reality of your eagerness to forgive sinners like us. God, we pray that we would go boldly from this place with our own lives as trophies of your grace, as testimonies of your power. And we pray that you would open our lips and ready our minds, give us feet that are shod with the swift progress of the gospel. And we pray that we would see our purpose on this earth as long as you leave us here as your ambassadors to represent you, to represent your coming kingdom, and to win citizens unto that kingdom. And we pray it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This is part three of Evangelism 101, sort of an introductory crash course on evangelism. And again, my goal in this series is to normalize and incentivize evangelism. That is, I want to make evangelism not the realm of the experts and the people with all the fancy answers, uh, but the realm of disciples, followers of Jesus, people who know Christ, who have been rescued by Christ, and are eager to tell others how they too can be rescued. Evangelism ought to be the normal activity of the Christian life. It is, frankly, why you're still here on this earth and have not been instantaneously perfected by death or rapture yet. You're here, and you're here to give testimony to the saving grace of God. And then, of course, we want to. We, we love to do that. And, and full confession, uh, just a reminder, I'm terrified of evangelism. It's kind of a strange thing to think about. I'm terrified of the fundamental purpose for my existence on this earth. That is true. It's hard to start conversations. We've been talking about the, the content of evangelism, the reasons we should do evangelism. Uh, last time we were together, we talked about the platforms for evangelism which are a, a life in keeping with the realities of the gospel, uh, to live with integrity before a watching world, to live with a clean conscience, to uh, be basing our lives on eschatology, uh, what's coming in the future. All of these things give us a ground and a platform for effective evangelism. And we left off last time. I, I want to I pick up with some questions that maybe you have encountered what do I do if I find myself talking to somebody who's smarter than me, or smarter than I, to be grammatically correct? They might even correct you on your grammar. What do you do if you find that somebody has these amazing intellectual arguments, and, and you can't talk yourself out of a paper bag? Uh, they're pointing out logical fallacies, and they're making deductions, and they talk circles around you. I just want to encourage you, do not be intimidated. No fancy arguments will ever refute the truth of God. And the reality is, you'll always find somebody smarter than you are. You, you talk long enough, you spend time with enough people, you're going to run into somebody who can outthink you. So, what is it that levels the proud? The grace of God brings somebody to humility. It was the great St. Augustine. I guess if you live in Florida, you say St. Augustine, or if you plant grass in your yard, you say St. Augustine. Uh, but it was St. Augustine who was full of himself. About 30 years old, a really sharp lawyer, had all of the arguments, and was living a profligate life. Do you remember what humbled him? It was a child elementary school-aged child singing a song, a little ditty about the Bible with the lyrics, take up the book and read. Maybe something like we sing today, the B-I-B-L-E. And it brought conviction by the power of God to his heart and it leveled him and this proud man of the world who had everything going for him 
and all the intellectual astuteness to refute anybody that came to him was leveled by a child and simple words about the Bible. So Christian, don't be intimidated by somebody who is smarter than you are. For all the smarts in the world do not attain heaven. In fact, I would suggest to you that all the lofty arguments end up being smoke screens for resistance to grace. And you just need to know that. You just need to see through it. All the smarty pants arguments are camouflage for, I don't want God to tell me what to do. So I have to come up with these big, fat, rational ideas that intimidate anybody that's going to come and tell me I need to repent and believe. So just see through that. Daniel, if Daniel wrote Psalm 119, said, I'm smarter than all of my teachers because I love your law. If you gravitate towards the Word of God, if you put your trust in the Word of God, in, if you have as your anchorage the truths of God's Word, then you have an ally on your side. Truth that will never be refuted. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody's going to beat up Jesus. Nobody's going to defeat the truth. Nobody's going to prove him wrong in the end. So he's your ally. The truth is your ally. The truth wins in the end. Maybe you've been out on Mill Avenue with people in our church uh, sharing the gospel uh, around the ASU campus. And so this question comes up, what do I do if I'm evangelizing somebody who's drunk? (laughs) Maybe you've had that experience. What should you do if you find yourself who is inebriated by alcohol or some controlled substance or, or maybe in a health situation where it makes them difficult uh, or it makes it difficult for them to understand? It, it slows up the mental capacities. What should you do? Um, I would suggest preach the gospel and preach the gospel when they're sober. Uh, there, there's a real benefit to sobriety. Uh, and helping people think about the truth. But I would suggest that perhaps it's not the best use of your time to get into circular arguments with somebody who is, at the moment, irrational. It, It might be better to move on. What happens if you find yourself talking to somebody who's part of a world religion and you don't know anything about it? Oh, this this guy is a Sikh or a Muslim or a Hindu. And, and oh, I, I didn't go read the Wikipedia entry on Hinduism. Uh, he's a Buddhist. Well, what kind? Is he a Tibetan Buddhist? Is he a Thai Buddhist? I need to know all the differences before I can evangelize somebody in their niche world religion. And I would suggest to you that research is fine. If you go to share the gospel in a Muslim country, it probably would help for you to read the Quran and study Islam so that you understand worldview, so that you can address the issues of the heart and the mind when you're there. But if you're out sharing the gospel and you meet somebody who's a Muslim, I'm going to tell you, if you're a believer, you already have the answers. In a very real sense, every world religion boils down to the same thing. It is the religion of human achievement. That is, man does something to achieve the thing. Access to heaven, access to heaven with the God of the Bible, uh, access to heaven with some other God, or a bunch of gods, or 72 virgins and green couches, or whatever it is, whatever the nirvana or end of things is in the religion, the way to get there is always human achievement. You have to do stuff. You have to acquire merit. And the reality is nobody in any world religion ever does enough to have security. There's not a religion in the world you're going to find where somebody says, yep, I've done it. Ask the best Catholic you know, have you done enough to get there? And a a good Catholic will say, I don't know. Ask any Muslim and they will say, Allah be merciful. And there, of course, are some satanic exceptions. Yes, Carol, you can ask questions. This is a quipping hour. Okay, what about universalism? Oh, that's an interesting. What is it? What is the what is the mantra? And it, universalists are are different depending on the one you talk to. But if you talk to say a, a Unitarian Universalist, what is the mantra? Be nice to people and don't judge. 
All of a sudden they have a morality and they're telling you what to do and standards of how to get there. Even if their end result is everybody gets to heaven. It, it's, it's still a, a religion of human achievement that comes with the legalism and the judgmentalism that is bound up in the human heart. So what do you do if you meet somebody that's in any of these other world, world religions? Must you be an expert on every religion to be qualified to share the gospel? No, friends, you just have to have your sins forgiven and know how it happened. And here's the, here's the great reality. If you're talking to somebody who is ready to hear the gospel, in other words, they, they have ears to hear because they are bound up in a world religion that makes promises it cannot keep, that has told them, do this, do this, do this, and they never know if they've done enough, and they're spinning their wheels on the, on the, on the hamster cage of human achievement and never, never knowing if they've done enough. Uh, picture Martin Luther on his knees climbing up the steps of the Vatican, going to the confessional booth, confessing for a while, coming out of the confessional booth, running back to the booth and saying, I sinned again since I left. Is there any hope? And you, the simple believer who have completely placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, have the answer. And it's simple and straightforward. And it's actually good news. And the Mormon who says to you, well, that's so proud to think that you've already achieved heaven. Well, it's not proud and I didn't, but Jesus did it for me and I have guaranteed eternal life and you can too if you will only believe. You have the answers. You don't need to know everything the prophet Moroni said to Joseph Smith when he gave him golden tablets. <laughs> it's, it's a good idea to study up on the worldview of the place that you're in to some degree. But in the end, that's not where the power is. The power for evangelism is not in your expertise. It's helpful to know, for instance, if you're going to Papua New Guinea, what the worldview and the mindset is of the people who are there. Because if you simply say you need to believe in Jesus, many of the people in the tribal settings in Papua New Guinea will say, oh, I do. He lives on that mountain over there. And they have no idea who Jesus is, but they already have the verbiage. If you know what they're thinking, that's going to help you not make assumptions. When you're talking to the Mormons at your front door, uh, I'll go back a little bit. When, when, um, when I was younger, the Mormons would come to the front door and say, we're not Christians. They would say, Jesus is not God. He's the brother of Satan. And as man is, so God once was. As God is, so man shall become. There is no trinity. Salvation is not by grace, it is by works. That was the Mormon message when I was younger. Mormons come to your door today, and what do they say? Jesus is God. Salvation is by grace. You need to invite him into your heart. They've taken on the language of the Baptists. <laughs> and evangelicalisms, they've, they've wanted to mainstream. And so it's helpful to know that they don't mean the same Jesus you mean. They don't mean by the word grace what you mean by the word grace. So sometimes it's helpful to ask enough questions uh, to know what people mean. But fundamentally, if your sins are forgiven because you have believed the gospel, you are well equipped to share the gospel with anybody on this planet. What if somebody is part of a cult and they use Bible verses? Have you had that experience? Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door and, and they start running to Bible verses. My encouragement to you is open your Bible. Go right there to the Bible verses that they use. Um, you might discover in one meeting how they are using them, and you might have to study your Bible a little, a little more. That's good incentive. But listen, somebody who has the wrong gospel will misuse the Bible. And so as long as you know that at the front end, you might know, not know how to answer their questions right away. But again, you know how to get to heaven, and they don't. And you know that the Bible is true. And so you can go back to God's word and study it for yourself. Your confidence is not in you or your ability to outmatch wits in an argument. Your confidence must be in the power of God and the gospel itself. What if they ask a question I don't know the answer to? Just say, I don't know the answer to that. But I know Jesus and I know how you can get to heaven. 
There are lots of rabbit trails and distractions people will like to go to. And then if they ask a question you don't know, go home and read your Bible some more. Figure out the answer. Come back for the next time. Um, But it's okay to say you don't know. It's far more important to recognize what you do know, and you do know the answer to the most important question any man could ever ask. What if somebody doesn't believe the Bible? Do you have to prove the Bible to use the Bible? Do you have to prove the existence of God in order to proclaim God? Do you have to prove the resurrection of Jesus in order to declare the resurrection of Jesus? I would suggest to you, no, you don't. See, the Bible is self-authenticating. The Bible actually is the sword of the Spirit and has supernatural power to discern between the thoughts and intentions of the human heart. There's nothing else like it. By the way, if you have something that is more authoritative than the Bible as the ground on which the Bible must rest, then you've elevated human things above God's things. It's just not the right approach. I understand the temptation. Somebody says, well, you keep using the Bible. Isn't that circular reasoning? Sure, admit it. I believe the Bible's true. Why? Because the Bible says it's true. But you believe the Bible, so you believe it's true in saying that it's true, and that's why you believe it. That's, that's, a, that's circular reasoning. Well, yes, it's circular reasoning. Uh, everybody uses circular reasoning. Uh, the question is, which circle are you in? <laughs> and who's the authority? Think about the person who says, no, 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 quoting the Bible to prove that the Bible is true is just circular reasoning. I'm objective. I am a scientist. I am a rational creature. Okay, Um, why do you believe the Bible's not true? You get all kinds of answers, but let's just go with the because science. Science knows a fish can't swallow a guy like Jonah. Science knows evolution. Science knows Long ages, distant starlight, you know, all the rest. The fossil records, I've been in conversations and people just say, well, dinosaurs. Hmm. How how does dinosaurs, how does the word dinosaurs mean the Bible is not true? But you get all kinds of answers to that. But the follow-up is, okay, science what? What does science say? Uh, Well, the scientific method. Do you know the scientific method? And if they can rattle it off, you can ask, well, who made the scientific method the authority? Oh, well, the scientific consensus. Everybody believes that. Oh, they do. Uh, Can we talk about that? How long has it been around? Uh, Is it 100% foolproof? Uh, Does all the world of science actually agree? And by the way, if you're applying the scientific method to things nobody was around for, you're not actually applying the scientific method. And who decided for you that the scientific method was going to be the ground of your authority by which you would decide all other facts? In the end, the person must say, well, I decided that. If you've got various authorities from which to choose to base your argumentation on, in the end, the self chooses the authority. So that circular reasoning just comes back to me. It just comes back to self. And the believer, the believer in God's word, has what we call a dependent epistemology. That is, I know what I know because I am dependent on my maker who knows all things. Whereas the one who rejects the word of God has what we would call an independent epistemology. I reject the knowledge of God as revealed in God's word, and I'm going with the circular reason that's, reasoning that's called me. I'm going to be autonomous in my epistemology. I'm going to be autonomous in the way that I think, the way that I acquire knowledge, how I ground my reasoning. It, it really is all about me. And I may try to conveniently say, no, 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 it's not about me. It's about all the other me's who wear white laboratory coats and claim objectivity, which they do not have. But in the end, it's all circular reasoning. All that to say... Um, don't be intimidated if someone doesn't believe the Bible. Frankly, I wouldn't expect somebody to believe the Bible without the Spirit of God. How does somebody get the Spirit of God indwelling them that will resonate with the Word of God which the Spirit wrote? By new birth. How does somebody get new birth? Preach the gospel and see what happens. That's the bottom line.
I would suggest that a lot of these situations are mere smoke screens. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 3. The attempt to put God in the dock, as C.S. Lewis put it, uh, that is the, the, the chair of defense in a courtroom, to, to put God on the witness stand as the defendant who must be accused and prosecuted and guilty until proven right is fundamentally backwards. Listen to what Jesus says in John 3, verse 19. This is the judgment. The judgment is not going to be God in man's courtroom. It's the other way around. Light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light. Why? For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And there are two categories of people in the world. God works in hearts and produces fruit that says, I like the light. And then there are people for whom the light coming into the world is a threat. And there is an emotional response to that threat in this text. Fear and hatred. And by the way, what did the darkness do to the light when it came into the world? Murdered the light. When man had a chance to kill God, man did. Of course, that was God's plan to save sinful man by Jesus dying on a cross. But you have to understand the human heart. The problem of the human heart is not informational. It is a moral bankruptcy. Men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. No amount of information changes the fundamental disposition of the human heart that loves darkness because it is darkness. There's a reason that a cockroach scurries for more cover when you pick up the thing that the cockroach is under. It doesn't like the light. It doesn't like the exposure. It's looking for more musty, dark, dank, creepy places to be. And that is the human heart. That's the condition we're all born in. In our darkness, when a ray of light comes in, and the ray of light says, if you believe, you can have life, and light, and joy, and satisfaction, happiness in God forever and ever, freedom from slavery to sin. It's all good news. And how is the good news received in the darkness? Get that light out of here. Kill the light. See, man's problem is not proofs. Man's problem is a moral corruption that harbors animosity to the truth when he sees it. That's why Jesus introduces this section with with the indictment. This is the judgment. Light came into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. So when somebody puts up a, an argument, just know, Christian, it, that's a smoke screen. That's a smoke bomb. It's a distraction. It's a red herring. I'm going to throw something out there to get you off the trail. Don't talk about the darkness of my heart. Don't give me the light of the gospel. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Can God build a rock so big he can't lift it? Ha! Oh, I don't know, I've never, never thought of that. Uh, how, how big is a rock and how big is God and what can he lift? And wait, if he can't, oh, you're right. And the guy says, ha, there's no God. Ha, has the darkness actually removed God by a silly philosophical conundrum? No, it just stumped me. <laughs> but he hasn't broken the gospel. You have some allies, by the way, in this battle to get through the smoke screens. Uh, Romans 1 gives us one of those allies. God is known by the things he has made so that men are without excuse, Romans 1.18 says. Psalm 19 says the heavens, that is the universe, are declaring, literally screaming out the glory of God. That is, there is an external ally uh, external to the human heart that you have as the evangelist. God made everything and everybody knows it. 
Romans 1 tells us what man does with that. He suppresses that truth in unrighteousness, similar to John 3, 19 to 21, because his deeds are evil. It's like taking all the information that is external testimony to God's existence, His power, and His attributes, and trying to stuff it in a box, close the lid, and sit on the lid. You know what's in there. You just can't let it be seen, because I want to keep living my life the way I want to live it. There's another ally, it's found in Romans 2, and it's the conscience. Men do by nature the things of the law. God has stamped it on the human heart. Categories of right and wrong. Talk to anybody that's rejecting the gospel, talk to them long enough, and and they will proclaim to you categories of right and wrong. Now they've rewritten what's right and what's wrong. They've called good evil and evil good oftentimes. Sometimes they haven't. Sometimes they know that murder is wrong. Um, Unless I need murder to live a more convenient life, then maybe it's not. People rewrite these things. But you talk long enough and they will say, don't judge. What is that? What is that complaint? Don't judge me. That, That is a moral complaint based on a standard of right and wrong. They are actually saying, it is wrong for you to assess my spiritual condition right now by telling me this good news. So stop it. And they're actually putting on display what is bent or or bound up in the human heart, a bent toward categories of right and wrong. Everybody's got it. Everybody's got a moral compass. And Romans 2 tells us this is a testimony of God's work in the heart. So what does God put outside the human heart, <clears throat> all the testimony in the universe that it is designed by God with certain powers and certain attributes. What does God put inside the human heart? Knowledge of Himself, everybody knows that God exists, and knowledge of categories of right and wrong. And when you combine those things, I know God exists, I know there's right and wrong, you leave humanity with the impulse when man gets in trouble to cry out to God for help. To cry out for mercy. It may not be repentance. It may not be long lived. But there is an impulse in the human heart that knows there's stuff bigger than me in the universe. And I think I might be in trouble. All of that's there. And that's an ally to the evangelist. If you've been forgiven. And if you know how you've been forgiven. Then you have what every unsaved person desperately needs. Sometimes they'll admit it. Most times perhaps they don't. It's like knowing that you have the cure for everyone's mortal ailment. And you just want to give that to them. (laughs) And they'll refuse. And they'll hate you. Um, And every once in a while, someone will say, you have the cure? I want that. And you know that it works. Your task is simply to dispense the information that every sinner on the earth needs. And when we think about the sort of a five-point outline of the way we talked about the content of the gospel last time, uh, it starts with God and His holiness, then man and His sinfulness, Christ and His cross work, finishing the work of forgiveness for everyone who will leave, the necessary response of faith and repentance, leading us all back to God. We get to know God and have Him as the great treasure forever and ever. But when you think about that content and that outline, Um, it's a great idea to combine the content of the gospel with the personal experience of you having believed. Tell people your story. Give people testimony. Uh, Like those giving testimony in an infomercial or those who are brought into a court of law and giving testimony of their experiences. You, in this world, give testimony of God's grace. Not as an abstract, Here's the points of the gospel you need to know to get saved. Yes, you must have those points. But as a personal experience of those realities, God has actually saved you for that purpose. Let's talk now about the theology of evangelism. This is point five in our outline. And I just want to encourage you, don't forget your theology as you're doing evangelism. And this goes back to some of the things we just covered, but you need to remember particularly your anthropology, your theology proper, and your soteriology. Okay, a bunch of big words. By anthropology, we just need to remember what is true about man. 
Anthropos logos, anthropology, the study of man. What is man like? And when we understand total depravity, universal depravity means everybody's a sinner. Total depravity means sin has affected every capacity of the human being, including the way you think and how you feel and what motivates you and the will. You remember the old commercial with the the frying pan and the egg. The egg is your brain. The frying pan is drugs. Crack the egg into the sizzling frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. Kids, don't do drugs, right? You need to think about the human brain that way as it relates to sin. The frying pan is depravity. And the human brain on depravity does not think straight. And we think we're so clever. We think we can be objective. None of us has ever been objective in our entire lives. We only think out of our worldview and from our inclinations inside our thoughts. And a mind that is hostile toward God can't ultimately think rightly about anything. Because math is related to God. Geology is related to God. History is related to God. There's not a subject matter in the world that you can think rightly in any ultimate sense without a right relationship to the one who made it all, who designed it all, who orchestrates and governs all of it. And so we cannot give to the unbeliever some sort of credence that he can think straight while he is suppressing the truth that the whole universe proclaims and that he himself knows in his heart. Do you understand what the truth suppression of Romans 1 produces in the one who is stiff-arming the God of the universe? It produces an insanity. You spend your whole life trying to stuff the knowledge of God that's external to you and internal to you into this box and sit on the lid and try to keep it shut while you go about your business of chemistry or something and think that you're going to do chemistry right? Your whole life has already been given to this insanity of suppressing what you know to be true and rejecting it because you're committed to darkness. That is not a great platform for doing science. It's not a great platform for doing anything. Don't forget our anthropology. Listen to Ephesians 2 verse 1. Paul says, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to walk. When you're doing evangelism, how ought you think about the spiritual condition of somebody who needs to hear the gospel? That one is spiritually dead. What can a dead person do? Nothing. What can a spiritually dead person do in the realm of spirituality? Nothing. What must happen if the spiritual condition of someone who needs the gospel is death? Life must be given. This is going to affect the way we do evangelism significantly. Can you impart spiritual life? Do you have the ability? No. That's going to affect the way we do evangelism. God uses means to raise the dead. And the means he uses is evangelism. We are implements, we're tools, uh, we use the means that God prescribes, but in the end, the only remedy to spiritual death is new birth, which is a work of the Spirit, a work from above. Don't forget your theology proper. By theology proper, we just mean our, our thoughts about God. What do we know about God? Well, God is sovereign. He is sovereign over all things. God is the great initiator. From Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Understanding that God is sovereign is so helpful in evangelism and missions. Uh, People ask some of the great missionaries that went out uh, from, from Europe in the great revival of missions in William Carey and following and ask them, why are you doing missions if God is sovereign? And, and they almost universally responded, how could we do missions if He weren't? And the reality is if you know that man is dead and you know only God can raise him from the dead through missions and evangelism, um, then what are you going to do if God does not raise the dead? There's, There's nothing you can accomplish. So a sovereign God is a critical part of your evangelism. Listen, this frees up your evangelism from manipulative tricks to try to get somebody to make a decision. This frees us from a a slavery to methods and tactics as if they are the answer or the power. 
The power is God. But we have to add to God's sovereignty in our thinking about theology proper to the fact that we serve a, a worshiper-seeking God. Remember Jesus' conversation with the woman in the well? This is John 4, 23. The Father seeks worshipers. Right? You put that together with total depravity in Romans 3. There is no one who seeks after God, but God seeks worshipers for himself, and he's going to go get them. How will he get them? Uh, we're, we're the means to that end. Ephesians 2, 5 after saying, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God made us alive. God is the one who makes us alive. So don't forget your theology. God is sovereign. He seeks worshipers. And he actually exercises the power to raise the dead. And then remember your soteriology, your, your doctrine of salvation. Salvation is the work of God. God is the one who foreloved before time began, according to Romans 8, 28 to 30. He predestined, he calls in real time, and then he justifies or declares righteous, and then he glorifies. There is this unbreakable chain of salvation from eternity past to eternity future. The work is all of God. He does it from beginning to end. And God uses means. Listen to Paul's words from 2 Timothy 2.10. I do all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain salvation and with it eternal life. Do you understand? Believing in election and predestination, foreknowledge, do not prohibit evangelism. For Paul, they motivated evangelism. Paul talked about laboring and striving, spending and being spent, giving his life over to the task of proclaiming the unfathomable riches of Christ. And he did that not as opposed to the sovereignty of God, but because of the sovereignty of God. Because God seeks worshipers and he will get his own, because of John 10, Jesus said, I will go get my sheep. And then God and his son Jesus tell his followers, so go proclaim the gospel. Paul understands that. Therefore, I'll do all things for the sake of the elect, in order that they may obtain salvation and with it eternal life. We don't sit on our theological haunches. We actually trust God as the one who works. Now, I grant that an elect tattoo would be nice. Wouldn't that be great to go out on Mill Avenue and just say, hey, roll up your sleeve and use a black light and discover a, an E, you know, for elect. Okay, good. I'll preach the gospel to this person because I know how this one ends. And God has seen fit not to have us do evangelism that way. How do you find the elect? How do you find whom it is that God is saving? Well, you indiscriminately preach the gospel to everything that moves. That's God's method. Our, our radio term for broadcasting is a, a farmer's illustration. It, it speaks of the farmer sowing seed and he reaches into his bag of seed and he casts seed broadly and it falls where it falls. And in a lot of places, stuff grows. That's where we get our word broadcasting. We are to broadly cast the seed of the gospel. And God is the one who produces the growth. There is no human technique that can guarantee it. There is no key to the human heart that will unlock some felt need. There's no magic argument. Uh, there's no proof that will win the day. Logic does not new birth the heart. It just can't. And we're intimidated sometimes out of evangelism because we think we have to have all the right answers said just the right way. And that's not actually what wins. A famous pastor came to my Bible college when I was in college and preached a sermon. And I remember the outline. He used the acronym SALT, talking about believers being salt and light. And it was a message on evangelism. And he said in that sermon, give me enough time with a human and I will find the key that unlocks that heart. And you, and you just have to think, if, if a man had that power... What is he doing ever sleeping? Give him some Red Bull. We need an intravenous supply of stay awake all the time something so that that man can go to every human heart and unlock everyone for the sake of the gospel. Friends, that is a man-centered view, not a God-centered view of how evangelism works. 
In fact, one of the men who uh, was prominent in the Second Great Awakening in American history, who invented the new measures, a man by the name of Charles Finney, believed that he likewise had the ability to convince people to make decisions for Christ. And at the end of his life, he lamented, it seems my lot in life was to bring about tens of thousands of spurious conversions. In other words, not people that truly loved Christ and walked with Christ, but people under whose influence who made a decision, a charismatic speaker, uh, someone who could argue somebody into a, a, a rational thought, a used car salesman, someone who had the ability to, to make all the, the things, all the arguments that were needed to get somebody to make a decision for Christ. And listen, I I have coerced decisions for Christ, for people who are not walking with the Lord. That is not to be equated with salvation. There's no magic argument, there's no heart key that someone has the ability to unlock. Dimitri was way smarter than me. Dimitri was a a double major in nuclear physics and something else in in the Ivy League uh, Russian University. Uh, where we were doing evangelism door to door. And Dimitri invited me into his, into his um, dorm. And I, I just said at his door, I'm from America. I don't speak Russian. I'm here to talk to people about Christ. He was eager to practice his English, invited me in, offered me a cup of tea. And he said with his arms crossed, I will not believe in God. And he explained that in, in Russia, of course, for 70 years, they had been taught there is no God. And so he didn't believe in God. He, he was an atheist. And, and he actually said to me, can God build a rock so big he can't lift it? <laughs> now, I had heard that argument before. Um, I, didn't, I still don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, it's an interesting conundrum. Uh, the, the other way that's phrased is, can God build the unstoppable cannonball and the immovable lamppost? And what happens when they meet? It's a question that doesn't get you anywhere. It just gets you off track of the truth and the realities. So I went over to Dimitri's window and I I grabbed the the curtain and I flung the curtain open and I said, who made this? I didn't even look out the window (laughs) until I looked out the window. And it was a gray overcast sky, drab communist gray concrete buildings and a one stick off a dead tree making its way across the... It's like the worst creation illustration ever. And instantly, Dimitri said, of course God made that. But if I admit it, I have to stop sleeping with my girlfriend and stop getting drunk on vodka all the time. He was very honest. He just articulated John three nineteen to 21. Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. He knew there was an immediate crisis. If he admits that God is real, his life is now accountable. So how do I not be accountable to God? I just won't admit that he's real. I'm an atheist. And listen, friends, there actually are no atheists on the planet. People proclaim atheism. You press them long enough. Do you recognize you would have to be omniscient and omnipresent to legitimately make the claim of atheism? I've been everywhere all the time, and I know there's no God anywhere to be found. That's an audacious claim nobody could logically make. And you talk to people long enough, and they go, well, okay, I'm I'm agnostic. Well, that that sounds intellectually honest. That that sounds kind of respectable until you, ah, gnostic, ah, gnosis, ignoramus, ignorant. It's It's a willful ignorance of what you know to be true. And and it's not a good place to bet your eternal life on. So just don't be intimidated. (laughs) Have a confidence in the truth. Undistracted by the smoke bombs of knowledgeable unbelief. Secondly, under the theology of evangelism, don't forget where the power is. What does Romans 1.16 say? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. What's the power of God for salvation? The gospel, the good news. Sometimes we feel like we have to build a bridge to the gospel. Well, if somebody's going to believe the gospel and so be saved, I I need to get them there. I I need some 
incredible pathway and, and, and sometimes we think the power is in our bridges. If I can, if I can get somebody w- with whatever emotions, uh, humor, clever arguments, uh, Loctite logic, if I can get them there, then they'll believe. And then we've just taken the power out of the gospel and put it in our bridge. Romans 1.16 is clear. Power's in the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Thirdly, don't misdefine success. Don't misdefine success. What is successful evangelism? We might be tempted to think tens of thousands of people get saved or one person gets saved. I would suggest to you that's the wrong definition of success in our task. If the power was on us, if the power was in us, and the responsibility was on us to raise the dead, then yes, that would be the definition of successful evangelism. Lots of dead sinners now alive. But that's not the task God has given us. He's given us the task of ambassadorship. You know what an ambassador is? A representative of the king. He proclaims the king's business Under the name of the king, with the king's authority, as a herald, here's what the king's message is. That's the task of evangelism. And so successful evangelism is fidelity to the message. Faithfulness to proclaiming the message. And listen, we have a good message. And you, You tell people good news, I've got the cure for all your ills. Here's freedom from slavery. Here's the free gift of eternal life. Of course we ought not be ashamed of that. it's, It's wonderful to proclaim. And every time you open your mouth and say, Jesus is good, can I tell you about him? That's just worship. I love the way Paul described his task. This is Ephesians 3.8. He said his task was to proclaim the unfathomable riches of Christ to the Gentile world. That's success. That's evangelism. Proclamation. And of course, we we do that enough. We, We do that regularly as a course of life, sort of like breathing in and out. Just... This is what we do. We, we tell people about Christ. God will bring people to himself. So don't misdefine success. Don't be discouraged if you're sharing the gospel with the same person, maybe someone who lives under your roof, again and again and again and again. Don't assume you've failed when you've been faithfully preaching the gospel. You have succeeded and you have worshipped. Keep doing it. Fourthly, pray for the impossible. Listen, the targets of evangelism, according to Romans 5, are are enemies of God. They are at enmity with Him. They're at war with God. According to Romans 6, they're enslaved by sin. According to 2 Corinthians 4.4, they're blinded by Satan According to Ephesians 2, they're spiritually dead. (laughs) So what's going to overcome all of that? What can possibly overcome the deadness of the human heart, the blinding to the gospel influence of Satan, in some cases the judicial hardening of God for sins that God hands them over to? What can overcome all of those things, not to mention the world system that is opposed to God, antagonistic to Him, and spits out lies? That's a lot to overcome. Is one conversation going to do that? One magic formula? One secret argument? One technique? No. This requires supernatural stuff. So pray. Years ago, I took uh, men from this church out on an evangelistic outing. Uh, I, I do not recommend uh, this as an illustration. It's better to talk about it than to actually do it. I did it once. I'll never do it again. Um, but but we, I, I told the guys we were going out on Saturday morning to go find people to share the gospel with. I took them to a cemetery. We got out of the vehicles. I said, okay, who's going first? And what I wanted was emblazoned on our memories 
this idea that when you preach the gospel, you ought to be imagining a, a field full of headstones. What must happen if someone is to believe God must raise the dead? God must raise the dead. So, um, what do you do? You, you pray. We have to pray. And, and pray that God would raise the dead as we're doing evangelism. We're praying for supernatural intervention and otherworldly miraculous stuff. And we take the confidence from 1 Corinthians 3, 6-9. We plant and we water, but God causes the growth. Fifthly, recognize our limitations. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. We read here Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. Verse 16. Someone came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Well, this is a good entry into an evangelistic conversation. This is a silver platter. And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, shall not commit adultery, shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to Jesus, all these things I have kept. And immediately we recognize he broke the bearing false witness one. No man has kept these things. Whatever standard he had erected for himself, whatever sort of external conformity for a, a general impression of sort of being a good guy that he had, he had concocted here, um, he, he had the, the audacity to say, what do I still lack? And, and it is possible that, that this man was very sincere and forthright and, and had worked hard his whole life to keep every commandment he knew about. It may have even had a, a clean conscience about these things. He did not understand the depths of sin. He did under, not understand the heart realities behind all of these commands. And Jesus said, verse 21, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And we discover immediately what was going on in the man's heart was a violation of that first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God above all else. And what did he love above God? Wealth, money, possessions. Now, Jesus has a strategic advantage in evangelistic encounter. He can see through the man's pretenses and he can see the heart. He knew the idol to address. And in his kindness and compassion with this man, he addressed the man's idol in short order. So, Christian evangelist, know your limitations. We don't have x-ray vision. You and I probably would not have had the conversation this way. We do not have Jesus' ability. We don't have omniscience. We don't read the heart. And then we misread other people's heart and motives anyway. We're just not reliable that way. Jesus had perfect x-ray vision. And what we learn from this is there is an idol underneath, hidden underneath the man's sincerity and goodness and approach to Jesus and sincere desire. I'd like to have eternal life. And you or I might have walked through some facts and, and gotten some sort of agreement and, and, and he walks into Christianity without being born again. Why? Because his idol has not been upended. And Jesus was able to see through all that cut to the chase. While you and I do not have that ability, we do need to recognize that acquiescing is not conversion. If we say the gospel to an unbeliever in a way that is agreeable to the unbeliever and the, and the unbeliever comes along in agreement with what we said and is not yet born again, then we haven't finished the work of evangelism. Boy, how do you get past our limitations on this? Um, I think we just want to be clear that people can use words and mean different things. Be aware of that. That people can give an outward appearance without an inward reality. In fact, that, that, um, that was confusing to 
every Christian in history, I would suppose. Certainly was confusing to the apostles. There were people who walked for a while with Paul and then didn't, forsook the way. Paul warned about those who would fall away. The apostle John actually tells his readers, there are some who went with us and they went out from us. And they went out from us to demonstrate they were never really of us. There are untouched idols in the heart. This is why it's helpful to preach the cost of discipleship. If anyone wants to come after Jesus, take up your cross. That's a death sentence. That's right. And follow me, Jesus said. If you love your father or mother more than me, you can't follow me. If you love stuff more than me, you can't follow me. If you love your life more than me, you can't follow me. Those cost of discipleship evangelistic messages will turn people away. And that goes against the grain of trying to get everybody in. What do I have to do to get you into following Jesus today? And the message that's preached often is, don't come to Jesus unless he's everything to you. Come to Jesus because he's everything. I would suggest that if, if we have not gotten to the untouched idols of the unbelieving heart, then we haven't presented the gospel in the angles that we need to yet. Which is why gospel conversations aren't usually found in, in one encounter. Sometimes somebody's ready. Somebody proclaiming the gospel meets somebody who's ready to believe the gospel. And from the evangelist perspective, it was a one conversation deal. But the reality is, um, lots of conversations are often required for people to understand. Your job is not to seal the deal. Your job is not to uh, close in an ask Jesus into my heart prayer and then assume that it's done. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with praying with people, um, but the, the prayer doesn't make the Christian. Does that make sense? Uh, this was confusing uh, in the sort of evangelical world that I grew up in. Um, praying a prayer saved you was sort of the mindset. Boy, how many times did I pray the prayer to make sure I got it right? <laughs> I, was, I was so certain I hadn't gotten it right after all those times. I'm going to try a little bit different wording. And in evangelistic encounters, uh, I found myself um, having people repeat prayers after me so that they got it right to kind of sign the documents. But those things aren't new birth. Number six, uh, remember that conversion is not the end goal. Um, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Uh, what, is, what do disciples do? They, they learn and they follow Christ. They are baptized and then they are taught all that Jesus commanded. Disciple making is not some, getting somebody a get out of hell free card and moving on. But introducing them to Christ and the introduction into the grace in which they now stand, Romans 5. It becomes a life of following Christ. In Colossians 1.28, Paul reveals his goal for believers that every man would be complete in Christ. And he labored and strived for that. And then finally this morning, I would encourage you, appeal to the will, but do not manipulate the will. Appeal to the will, but do not manipulate the will. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors for Christ and we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Listen, if someone becomes a believer, they do so because the human will surrenders to Christ. You don't become a Christian and hate Jesus. God doesn't um, go around the human will to bring them to Christ. He goes straight through it and changes the will. It is appropriate that people will to love God. They're actually obligated by Scripture to obey Him, to believe in Him, you can appeal to the will, but we do not manipulate the will. Uh, Peter said in 2 Peter uh, 1.16, we did not employ cleverly devised schemes in our proclamation of the mystery of Christ to you. Again, that's just not where the power is. That's not our responsibility. And the cleverly devised schemes actually infiltrate and affect the content of the message. So we just confidently, humbly proclaim the message of the gospel. That's what evangelism is. 
We'll come back for one more session on this next week, Lord willing, and we'll see you then.